Um, I don't know whether you can see from the title there, some of these titles um, might be lacking in inspiration. Uh, you know, Back to School, Part 3, The Miraculous Work of the Holy Spirit it might be kind of clinical. So we might be in the future doing a series. And so I've come up with some creative titles. And this is the first one that we might do in a new series. It's called The Day My Girlfriend Tied Me Up in the Bedroom. <laughs> or if you prefer something more mundane, Lessons from Samson and Delilah. <laughs> we heard that on a podcast recently. <laughs> You thought, wow, all sorts of things that were conjured up in your mind by the first title. And then, oh, okay, Samson and Delilah, we know that one. <laughs> anyway, I do have um, some things to share this morning on the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And how many of you would like to see miracles in our midst more than we do? Would you raise your hand? God is a miraculous working God. And so the power of Pentecost, as you can see the little picture there where the fire of God fell upon the people on the day of Pentecost, they were prepared they i guess they didn't know what was coming but they knew something was coming jesus said go and tarry there go and wait in the in the upper room as, as it turned out and then the holy spirit fell upon them and then later on when paul um uh, wrote his letter he kind of summarized things a little bit and he said for the kingdom of god is not in word but in power so he was looking back over his ministry at that time he was writing to the Corinthian church and he was saying to them, Hey guys, you know, when I came to you, you didn't find me to be that razzmatazz kind of preacher that would wow you off your feet through, through my charisma and through my oratorical skills and everything. But it was the power of God that really captivated you and set, set the things of God, the kingdom of God, apart from what you were used to doing in Corinth. And Corinth was pretty um, a rough place. It was, um, um, you know, what's it? I think that might be it. Yeah, thanks, Janine. <laughs> Maybe that'll help. We got a little bit of feedback there. But, you know, the, the Corinthian church was used to all sorts of stuff going on in the spirit realm. But when the power of God came, it captivated them. And, and if I look at people that are struggling in their lives with certain issues and, and things that they're facing, really what has happened is that they're no longer captivated by the things of God. And I don't know how to deal with this except to perhaps um, uh, put it on mute and just rely on, on regular. So let's do that. So anyway, moving right along here. Have a look at this next slide here. I don't know whether you've got to a point this last week even where you felt that the Word of God that you've been studying, the Word of God that you understand is just simply not enough. And so we've got this photograph here of this huge, big, earth-moving um, piece of equipment and that's an image that the Lord gave me is that he said at, at one particular time not in these words but he kind of gave me this picture that if there's something big that needs to be moved in your life don't try and do it in your own strength with a little shovel because it could take you your whole lifetime to move that particular thing and we've got uh, earth movers across the road in a subdivision that has developed across the road. It, it was a forested area. There were some couple, a couple of old homes in it and everything. And they eventually tore everything down and they brought these huge machines in, absolutely huge machines that would, they would cut the trees down. The trees would fall. They would chop them up and get in, into lengths and everything. And the machines were doing it. It wasn't some guy with his little chainsaw and so on. The machines would come in, they would grab the tree and they would tell it, chop, chop, chop put it over there and another machine would come and put it on the other truck and off it will go. And if something was done in a day that would take me probably about six months to do, you know, in a day because of the earth moving machinery. And then they started to scrape the land and everything like that. And the whole area has been transformed into a new subdivision. And so the transformation that needs to take place in our lives only takes place when we realize that the greater one dwells on the inside of us. You can see from that scripture where it says there in 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Now, if you don't start from a revelation that God is on the inside of you, not out there somewhere distant, somewhat impersonal, 
somewhat engaged, he's kind of got things going and running in the universe, but me personally, I'm not so sure because I'm not seeing the results that I want to see. If you see it that way, perhaps this ought to be a reminder of how important it is to realize that God is up close and He's personal in our lives. And so even when we read our Bibles and we begin to think, okay, God, you know, I'm reading, I'm meditating. Last week the pastor talked about the importance of the Word. Well, now this week he's talking about the importance of the Spirit. So we need to kind of get two sides to the same coin, which is what you see here. Two sides to the same coin, a bunch of coins there, the Word and the Spirit working together to provide the currency of the kingdom. And I don't know whether you can see that this is a blank coin here. If you were dealt a blank coin when you went into the shops and they gave you some change of, you know, 25 cent piece or even a dollar coin if you came across one of those or cents or a dime or a nickel and there were not two sides to it, you would feel shortchanged. And I think many, many folk in the church today in the church world, amongst believers even, people that, that have chosen to believe, even though they haven't seen God personally, they're believing, they feel shortchanged at times. The enemy might come and, and put thoughts in your mind and say, you know, you're missing out on something here. Well, it's true in a sense because we need the Word and the Spirit together. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Once again, the Apostle Paul, when he uh, re re relays things to the Corinthians about his first visit there, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Boy, have I heard people that have got a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, uh, human smarts that, that just actually wow you off your, off your chair. But... Paul said, no, I didn't come to you with that. I came to you in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And the one thing that captivated us, you know, Sue and, and, and myself and then our family by extension in the early days of, of our church experience was that there was a, a move of the Spirit in such a way that it caught your attention. You were seeing things that you'd never seen before you were hearing things that you'd never heard before, and you were seeing changes that were affected only by the Spirit of God. And we were talking about it, um, you know, in the last couple of days, about uh, the pastor that we, we had, and he's still pastoring there. His, his oratorical skills, I mean, he was, a, he was a communicator, no doubt about it, but his oratorical skills, his choice of words and everything, were such that he, he didn't have you sitting on the edge of your seat. But you sense the presence of God. I remember the one occasion he said, you know, all things are from God. A-L. And then he left it there. He spelt all. He didn't know how to spell. I mean, he was, he was a, a bodybuilder, you know, muscle man. And he was a bouncer at, at a nightclub before he got saved. And when he first got saved, he would go out into the youth groups and he had a guy um, who would bring his guitar and sing a couple of songs to get people's attention. And then he would, he would stand there because he was really, really well built and everything at that stage. And he would take his shirt off. <laughs> and he'd say, you don't have to be a sissy to follow Jesus. And that was his pitch. I mean, that was the, the sum total of his pitch and his sermon and his preaching to the kids. And yet he had an anointing upon him that he would preach a sermon entitled Hickory Dickory Dock. The mouse ran up the clock. And then he'd say, anyone want to accept Jesus? And a hundred people would come forward. I mean, that's, that's the extent of his theology, it seemed, at that particular point in time. Now, I'm, I'm obviously stereotyping it and exaggerating. I'm speaking evangelistically a little bit, you know, <laughs> if you know what I mean, about him. And I don't want to, to discredit the anointing upon his life and his obedience to that. But it definitely wasn't his human wisdom, enticing words and everything like that. There was a sense of the Spirit of God. What was there that stuck out for you, Sue? Anything that really pops up at this point about that early, those early years of an experience? Anything you want to share? I know I'm putting her on the spot here a little bit there, but we haven't prepped this, so. <laughs> it's hard to say, but I remember one night um, we were worshiping the Lord. It was after the meeting, and um, the, the people wouldn't go home. It was, uh, there'd been such an impact. And not, I mean, I can't remember what he said or anything, but we just started worshiping, and we had a very anointed worship group too. He 
just started worshiping the Lord and the people would not leave. They eventually turned the lights up and they could see. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was amazing. It was one of those times where you just hungered for the presence of God and it was there and you just didn't want to leave. Yeah. And, you know, the recognition about it, because if you look back at our lives, a personal walk with the Lord and things that we were dealing with and everything, we were definitely not perfect people. And the people that we worked with on staff and everything like that and that we knew intimately, they were not perfect people either. So there was this other dimension that was related to who we were. There was faith and there was obedience, but, but there wasn't perfection. And yet the Spirit of God, by His grace, was there. The Spirit of grace was there. And people's lives were changed. People were, were saved. People were healed. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, they were, they were, their hearts were turned around. Their marriages were restored. And their finances turned around for the better and, and things like that. It was wonderful. And, and so what I want to do this morning is just focus a little bit on the, the, the spirit side of things, the side of the coin. And so when we look now at how Jesus performed miracles, he <laughs> operated, Jesus, in his humanity as a, a real human being, operated in the Holy Spirit's power to perform the miracles. Now, I don't have too much time, and I have gone into it in, in a previous series and everything, but this morning, let's just suffice to look at Acts chapter 10 as proof of this. It says here how God anointed God the Father anointed Jesus of Nazareth Jesus of Nazareth in, in his humanity of Nazareth not of heaven for eternity but of Nazareth born of Mary the virgin um, you know back in the day but he anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power Jesus had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power who then went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil Interesting. For God was with him. Now, can we say that the same Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of us? I believe we can say that. We should say that and begin to function in the delegated authority that Jesus has given us um, in his word. And so... In answer to the question, the next question, but what about us? We, we're ordinary. That was Jesus, the Son of God. We're ordinary. Well, take a look at Peter now. Peter the Apostle, okay, he was preaching at one time after the day of Pentecost. He went down to Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, funny enough, part of an occupying army in the whole area there. And he went to his household, and he was preaching the word of forgiveness that is found in Jesus by faith not by a set of works he was preaching this message and while acts 10 44 peter yet spoke these words and when you look into the all the verses around this particular passage here you find out that he was speaking the word of forgiveness the holy spirit chose to interrupt the service so what i'd like to do is i'd like to give the holy spirit permission to interrupt anything that we're doing because we do our best don't we how many of you do your best when you come here on, in the morning, uh, on Sunday mornings especially? On Saturdays, you're as bad as anything, but Sundays, you're a goody two-shoes. No, 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 I'm just kidding at that point. But, yeah, we, we're giving it our best shot as we understand things at this particular point. But we welcome the Holy Spirit. We sing songs like, Set Me Ablaze and Let There Be Light and everything like that. And we kind of get through the, the worship um, song part of things there. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a dimension of the work of the Holy Spirit that I believe that we need to reach for by faith. And so we're starting to look into this here. And the Holy Spirit then fell on them who heard that word that he was preaching. So there's a connection between the word that is preached and the falling of the Holy Spirit. The word and the Spirit work together. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. So, you know, if you have the mindset where you think, Okay, if God in his sovereign will chooses to manifest himself in a spiritual way, it's his business. All we've got to do is put our head down and walk the walk of faith. Well, in one sense, that's true. But in the other sense, when we read the scripture, we know that God is here and we are here, let's say. 
And the miracle working power that has been made available to us in the Holy Spirit has to be activated, has to be engaged with, has to be reached for in faith or released out of us in faith. However you see it, um, that's, I believe, what we need to be looking at. Now, in answer to this question, but what about us? Can't we then turn in the next point here, but Peter was an apostle and I'm not. God had chosen back in the day to use these apostles, Peter, James, John, all of these guys that we read about in the book of Acts and so on. And they performed these wonderful miracles that got the church going. It gives us something to focus our attention on and just glorify God while we're looking at, look at all wonderful things that they did in Jesus' name. What about us now? Did it go beyond just the apostles to another category of believer? And by extension, from that category of believer to all believers, and then from all believers, believers down through the generation to where we are in the 20th century, 21st century. I believe so. And so we take a look at Philip quickly now. Philip was just a deacon. Now, does anyone know what a deacon is in a church? Do you know what a deacon is? Mm -hmm. A deacon is someone who gives you a lot of trouble when it comes to the color of the chairs, the color of the carpet. No, no, I'm just kidding. Now, deacons are supposed to serve the needs of the church that the, the leaders, leadership of the church um, uh, releasing the leadership of the church to function in a different way. And so the context of this Acts chapter 6 here, without going into too much detail, is such that they had to choose in the church because stuff was happening, that people were not getting their needs met as far as the food distribution and things were concerned there. And so what they did is they chose a bunch of deacons. And have a look here in Acts chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Seek out from you, this is the instruction that they got, seven men... Of good reputation. So it's just ordinary laymen, men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, God's wisdom, whom we, this is the apostles, may appoint over this business of distributing the food. But we, the apostles now, will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, they were prepared to get their hands dirty. The apostles were running around. The church had grown from uh, 120 people to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, then later on to 5,000, and then just by extension in the city of Jerusalem alone, the church had grown to possibly even beyond 20,000 in a short period of time. And there were some people who needed help with food. And so they had distribution centers, and there were people who would bring in and, and help, the, help the poorer folk amongst the community. And the apostles were involved. But they were so involved that they were neglecting the ministry of prayer and word. And so they said, we need to organize ourselves. And that's what they did. And so this saying, verse 5, pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip. Everybody say Philip. Philip comes into the picture here because later on when we go and have a look at Philip as the miracle worker, look at this here in Acts chapter 8. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere. There was a lot of persecution that, are, uh, that happened at that time, and so they, they dispersed, preaching the word. Then uh, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Isn't that interesting? He started to preach the focus of Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Now, this was an ordinary guy who was full of the Spirit, who was of good reputation like all of the other deacons, who went around preaching the gospel. They didn't leave it up to the hotshot evangelists in the group. They didn't leave it up to the apostles in the group. He went around preaching the gospels with these miracles uh, that they were able to hear and see. Now, I don't know what they heard. Maybe they heard the people being filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, casting out devils, because verse 7 gives us some kind of a clue. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came uh, out of many of those who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame. So there's the hearing and the seeing side of things, plus a few more, I'm sure. But many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. So this is kind of characteristic of uh, what was going on in, the, in this particular character's ministry there 
back in the day. So I'm wanting you to see it from the point of view of you sitting here, looking at me, preaching, hearing what I'm having to say, and then thinking about the rest of your life and who you are and what God may just expect of you and I when we start to tap in to that other side of the coin, the spirit side as well as the word side. Okay, so the miraculous, I believe, if you look at it this way, doesn't just drop in our laps. It's not because God is withholding something. It's something that we have to overcome. And I, I use the word there, resistance. It's part of the resistance that, that, is, that is found in our human experience. Look what Jude, verse 3, towards the back of the Bible, right just before the book of Revelations. This is what Jude wrote. He said, Beloved, I found it necessary to write to you. So I found it necessary this morning to share with you these thoughts. And Jude found it necessary to write, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. See that? Contend earnestly for the faith. Because if we don't contend, we won't overcome the resistance. So let's say I'm, I'm trying to um, um, push something forward here. There's a big rock here. I'm working out in the yard. There's a resistance. This rock wants to stay in the same place. I have to push against that rock take a lever and put another rock there and a big iron thing and then roll that rock against resistance from here to there. There's something that I have to do in order to overcome that resistance to get to the place that it ought to be. And this is what Jude is, is rock, uh, talking about. And he says here, let's contend, strive against with effort those things that stand against us. And there's two areas that I believe are important to consider here quickly. First of all, religious opposition. Back in the day, the Pharisees would say, you know, this is just not quite, kind of the way things are. Um, we've got a system going here, and Jesus and you apostles and now Philip, you're coming up with all sorts of things that we don't quite believe in. We, don't, we, we, we stand against it, and so there was a lot of opposition from the religious circles that they were in that they had to overcome. And, you know, being here in, in the Seattle area, um, you know, for a while now, there are a lot of churches that are doing wonderful things, but they don't always believe in, this, in the miraculous. They kind of do a good job of this aspect over here, and I don't want to be critical of them in any way whatsoever, but there's definitely a resistance to the things of the, of the Spirit and the miraculous that kind of feeds into and plays into, the, perhaps they're playing it safe because they don't want to be found to be on the weird end of the spectrum, you know? And so, well, we don't want to be weird either, right? We just want to be truthful. We want to go according to the, what the Bible says about the things of the Spirit. And so that's what we, 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 we're endeavoring to do. But these, these Pharisees back in the day were standing in opposition, and yet they had to overcome it. There was persecution. They told them to shut up, sit down, and don't preach anything in the name of Jesus, and don't, don't stir the pot here. Just you and your small corner, just stay over there and don't, you know, Get, don't, don't, don't upset the apple cart. Well, then on the other hand, there's the general cultural and social opposition that you and I in our modern 21st century situation might find. Because if you take, and Greg has to deal with a lot of people at, at high schools now, there, Greg, if you had to pass a comment, would you say that the average kid growing up in modern high school here in our local area is being taught the things of God, exposed to the things of God, has a, has a general feel for things from day one when they enter school at about age six to the time that they leave age 16, 17? Are they experiencing that or are they experiencing an education that is devoid of the things of God? What would your answer be? Yes, it's devoid. devoid. They're growing up in a culture, in a society that is not gearing up people to believe in God. There's actual resistance to the things of God. And they come up with things in the Constitution. And they say, you know, we need separation of church and state. And the church needs to be in its little corner. And you can believe what you believe because we've got freedom of religion in America. But don't allow your faith to bleed over into the economic realm, into the political realm, into the cultural realm, into the arts and media, into education and everything. We've got all this under control. You can be cute in your little corner over there. Well, is that the way God sees a society? I don't believe so. And so there's a lot of conditioning 
that people growing up in our society are facing a resistance to the things of the Spirit. And so when we look at this next slide here, we've got a beautiful picture of an operating room, and Sue's just started on a new new course in, in her job, job scenario here. And in, in trying to answer the question, why is it that in the 21st century where we have modern medicine and everything, do we need miracles? of healing. Let's just fo focus in on that for the moment. Even in our modern scientific dominated world. Well, most people, if you take the planet now and think of God now, God in heaven, looking down at the whole planet where there's seven billion people plus in this current generation, never mind all the billions of people that lived before, but right now, seven billion people, they say, on the planet here. How many of those people have access to this kind of medicine, modern, high-tech medicine. Maybe, Sue, you can speak of some of the experience here that you, you just had that might be pertinent to this point here. I mean, the modern medicine, the, 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 the cleanliness, the, the whole protocols associated with it, just, just maybe share something, just a quick story about that. Well, just the intensity of it. The intensity and the expense of um, modern medicine. Yeah, I mean, certainly, let's just say the Western countries, Europe, um, first world countries, if that means anything to you, America. In all parts of America, do you think this kind of standard of, of medicine is available to all? Do all have health services like this? Can all afford it? No, they can't. It's incredible. Sue says that they, you know, if you brush up against the table in your gown and you outside of the sterile field you, you're supposed to be sterile between your head and, and your, yeah. here and here if any other part of let's say your hair you know if it's not in one of those things that you wear or some some part of your your arm brushes up there they consider that contaminated and they have to take the whole table of instruments all of the equipment all of the stuff and just trash it and it must amount to what Thousands or tens of thousands or in the end hundreds of thousands at the end of a day in eight operating theatres. Yeah, well, it's, it, the equipment used would amount to hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Now you go to Africa, where we come from, you won't get this kind of no. Thailand, uh, Indonesia, parts of India, I'm sure, China, South America. There are literally... I'm just going to take a stab at it. There must be billions of people that have not got access to what we consider modern scientific medicine. So could you say that there are communities that if they don't get a miracle, they will die of contaminated water diseases? They will die from infection from doctors and, and protocols in the, in the local clinics and everything where they had to have surgery on something. They will die from, from infections because they don't have enough of this and enough of that in the medical situation, by the millions. Yes or no? Would that be fair or exaggerated? I, th I think it's fair to say that. And so just, just as, a, as a point of logic, the miraculous power of God, God knows these things, and he loves people, and he wants to help people in their physical, practical sphere of life when they're sick and when they're, when they're diseased and they've got issues. And so, uh, never mind the 21st century, which is point number one now, have a, have a look at point number two here. Point number two, the next point there, talks about medical practice can only take us so far. Are, are we able to get that next one there, Greg? Yeah. Ancient medical practice, you know, when back in the Egyptian days, back in the Bible times and everything like that, there was a woman who had an issue of blood, and she had been like that for, was it 12 years? Does anyone? 18 years? 12 or 18 years she had an issue of blood. She had some feminine issues and everything like that. And she had spent all that she had and her family's resources on trying to get healed, and yet it got worse. 
Now that was at the time where the temple was there. They had the the the, the laws of of the biblical laws, and the, it was the time when Jesus was walking, and he she had to come to him and touch the hem of his garment to get healed. So in other words, back in the day, even medical science could only take people so far. And so Jesus comes along, and he's redemption on two legs. You know what the word redemption means. It means buying you back from under the dominion of Satan's sin, sickness, and poverty, and all of the nasty stuff that he brings into our world. Jesus comes, and he buys us back, and he pulls us into his kingdom. We respond to his grace by faith, and now suddenly we're under his protection. We're under his covenant, and he redeems us. And so what I'm saying is that he, he redeemed people. He didn't point people. He didn't say to the woman of the issue, you know what? I tell you, there's a great doctor in Mexico, and he's got a new cutting-edge technology. You need to get a boat and go there and get healed. No, Jesus healed them. Do, do, do you get my drift here? He did what the medical practice of the day could not do. Redemption, as you see from there, trumps creation now should we eat good food should we exercise should we get good sleep should we uh, uh, practice good hygiene protocols i believe so should we make sure that our food's properly cooked so that the bacteria and you know that type of thing all of that stuff is is fine but when it doesn't deliver what are we left with we're left sometimes with religious people saying oh it's the will of god he's trying to teach you something now, that doesn't sound cool, to me at least. It sounds like religious resistance. Or we're faced with a situation where the doctor looks us across the table and he says, you know, we're doing our best, ma'am. This is the best that we've got. We've got these pills and we've got that and everything, but, you know, this is just the way things are. You, you must try this and you must try that. And he sends you out the door falling short of what you really need. But if we serve a God who is real and he really loves us and really paid the price at the cross to cover all of our needs, whether we have access to this modern technical stuff which has its limitations or we don't, we have a God who stands in the middle and says, come to me, come to me, focus on me, my redemption trumps anything that you can do in your own strength. Because in the Mediterranean diet, how many of you have heard of the Mediterranean diet? Or the paleo diet? Anyone had the paleo diet in the last six months or anything? Or the Mediterranean diet? Well, do you know what? People were sick eating the Mediterranean food 2,000 years ago when there were no pesticides, no insecticides, no Monsanto GMO, no nothing, no nothing, no nothing. It was all the fish and all of the nuts and all of the figs and all of the olive oil and everything. It was all pure. And yet the people were sick in their droves. Jesus had to go around healing people who were sick of here and Philip had to go into some area and heal people and so on and so on and so on. Are you, are you, are you getting what I'm trying to say here? Hmm. We need God no matter what. Okay, so let's just kind of wrap things up here in terms of an application. And I'm not trying to be difficult this morning, but I, I would be remiss personally if I didn't share with you what I understand from the Word of God. And so it behooves you now to take what is in the Word of God and say, okay, he's taken a few stabs at a few pointers here this morning about the miraculous power of God as it pertains to particularly healing, let's say. It behooves you to get into the Word of God and really settle the matter for yourself. Settle the matter for yourself. You have your lifetime. Put it on your bucket list. I will settle the matter that God is a good God and I'm going to apply my faith and I'm going to reach out and I'm going to look unto Jesus, the author and the developer of my faith, for every area of my life starting with this issue, starting with that issue, whatever it is. Okay. So how exactly, let's try and wrap this up. How exactly do you and I contend for the faith? You remember we mentioned a scripture earlier on? 
talking about contending for the faith. It just doesn't drop in our laps, this stuff. We have to contend for it. Well, number one, desire the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. You see that there? Number two, recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us. And then number three, expect the miraculous. I get up every day and I say, God, this is the day. This is the day that miracles happen. And we've seen a smattering of miracles. And yet, Jesus' ministry, it was day by day. The apostles, it was day by day. It was the deacons, it was day by day. And then Jesus himself said, you know, through Mark chapter 16, he said, uh, he said those who believe shall lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Those who believe, it's, it's available for all of us. And so I, I think if we don't expect something, then God is not going to force it on us like anything. And so those three things, desire, recognize, and expect, kind of it puts an attractive pull on God's power. Hopefully this is making sense to you. And just in conclusion, as we prepare to take communion at this time, as a final takeaway, when it looks like there's no way out of your situation, whatever it may be, and today you might kind of have things more or less in order, but tomorrow you might be faced with a situation that's just out of your reach. But God, know that Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth, and that he will make a way when there seems to be no way. I'd like to encourage you with those words. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier on, we come from Africa, and it's been how many years now, Sue, since we moved to America? 94. So what does that make it? 38 years? No, 20, 20, 28. 28 years. Sorry. <laughs> My maths, you know. 24 years. 24 years. There you go. <laughs> 24 years. And so we've been wearing Western clothes for 24 <laughs> years. We finally worked out how to use a washing machine and a tumble dryer and a microwave and a stove and drive motor cars and everything. Because, you know, we come from Africa where you've got giraffes and you've got elephants and you've got lions and tigers and, 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 and warriors running around with spears. Woo! Oh, no, that's Red Indian. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, God. I just, I just blew it again. Anyway. I'm, I'm saying all this to set you up for this next song because here's a church that you've probably not heard about. It's called Christ Embassy Church in Nigeria, Africa, Lagos, Nigeria. And Nigeria's got about 90 million people, I think. <coughs> the continent of Africa's got about 500 million people, so they say. We used to live on the tip of it, South Africa, right at the tip of it, in a modern Western culture. Johannesburg, the city that we grew up was, had skyscrapers, had freeways, it had hospitals with surgeons, it had shopping malls, it had cars, it had soccer fields, it had everything that you have here in Seattle, just a la 1990s when we left, right? And in Nigeria, I don't know whether you know anything about Nigerian churches and everything, but I've mentioned one before where the, the auditorium for the one church seats 50,000 people in one sitting. 50,000. This church is, is like, let's just say 10,000 or whatever. And so this worship leader, she, she's someone you probably never heard. I heard her, her songs sung recently when I went to Tampa and everything. And so I Googled it and YouTubed it and everything like that. And she has produced songs that have gone around the world that I didn't even know about. And so I'd like to encourage you to open up to the things of the Spirit, to the exuberance. And it's not that we're going to adopt the style of worship and everything suddenly in the church and so on like that. But just be open to the miraculous message of the Waymaker as we partake of this communion. Watch the words. They are on the back of your bulletin, by the way. They will be shown on the screen here too. And it's pretty powerful experience that we see here on the video as we partake of communion, so feel free to do so at this time. The music will start in a moment. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Hallelujah. Thank you. Please feel free to partake of communion.